Hey everybody, I'm Scott Weichel. You're listening to My Kind of Country, the legends here on a Monday night. And I certainly have one of those legends here as my special guest tonight. She is a multi-award winning artist, Grammy nominee, a member of the North American Country Music Association International Hall of Fame. One of the best in the business and my, one of the favorite people that I get to talk to. And she's coming up here to do some shows in Michigan uh, in July and then again in September and October. So all of my Michigan listeners, listen up because we're going to give you that information. You can go and see her she's coming up to do some great shows to benefit our wonderful policemen and sheriff's associations here in michigan it's my honor to welcome lacey j dalton to my kind of country <laughs> hi lacey God, it's great to be talking to you again oh. i can't wait to see you we're going to be seeing you in manistee you and Merritt and sarah and uh i'm thrilled i really am thrilled i think the only thing that could be better about these shows is if i were doing them with bobby bear oh gosh that would be great i love bobby bear <laughs> he was the first act i ever toured with and i just he? love him wow he is you know from michigan yeah he did some of these shows up here a few years ago too oh he is the best entertainer it is so fun to go see him oh yeah he is the funniest thing he and Johnny Lee, I swear, when I perform <laughs> with them, I never don't watch their shows. I go and watch their shows because they're different all the time, and they're I, they eat, both of them will just do anything or say anything. Yeah. They're, just, yeah. they're just the greatest people to tour with, and I've been touring with them for my entire career on and off. Oh, they're great people. Uh, Johnny Lee was up here, too, a couple of years ago. I've had him on the show several times, and you just never know where it's going to go when you talk to Johnny <laughs> Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and Bear, too. The Bear's that humor is a little drier. Oh, yeah, he's laid really back. You really have to listen to Bear. Yeah, <laughs> he's just kind of laid back. Out you know? He's out there. I love these guys. Oh, I guess yeah. Johnny uh, has been having a little trouble um, with his, uh, you know, with his ankles or his feet or something, so he's getting treated for that right now. So he'll be out and pounding the pavement again in those cowboy boots. All right. That's great. I know he's doing a lot of shows with Mickey Gilly, too, this summer. I know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Gilly, you know, he's had such a lot of such challenges. But it, I, I toured with those guys during the Urban Cowboy days. Uh, we all toured together all the time. It was really fun. Gilly is so much fun to interview. I I basically just have to ask a question, and then I just sit back, and I'm done, you know? <laughs> <He> just, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been at it a while, yeah. you know? Yeah. And he's got stories, and, and he's a funny guy, too. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget. He said, you know, he said, Lacey, out here on the road, he said, you know why we get fat on the road? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I wish we didn't. He said, because we have to eat in self-defense. He said, you just never know when you're going to stop, and when you do stop, you don't know if there's anything you're going to like, then you end up eating french fries. <laughs> and you have to eat in self-defense because you don't know how soon you'll you know people think the road is very luxurious and stuff but it really in those days it really wasn't because we were doing one-nighters you know we were going all over the country because before the DUI laws there were little um, honky-tonks everywhere sure. and you just stopped somewhere every night and did a show yeah. and I it was I, I remember being the first the three years I was on the road I was first on the road uh, with um, Bear and with the Oak Ridge Boys, and then with Willie for almost a year. And we were on the road um, sometimes over 300 days a year. Wow. And more like 325 or 30 sometimes. And we, I didn't know, I mean, I just hit the ground running. And, um, you know, I, back then they had matchbooks in the um, ashtrays in the motels where we'd stay. And I'd have to look at the matchbook to remember where we were. <laughs> I mean, it was exhausting and it was, it was really something. But I'll never forget Mickey talking about... Um, having to eat in self-defense. That's great. I love it. I love it. I bet you wouldn't trade those days for the world, though, you know? Well, you know, I, they were. it was amazing. It was wonderful. But I'll tell you, after about the third year of it, I went to my sister was living in Michigan at that time, and I went to her house, and after 300 days or over on the year, a year for three years in a row, I wasn't even sure when I got to her house I liked country music anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just let me sleep. Just leave me alone. I don't you know, I don't know if I, I might hate this, but, uh, if, you know, it's just when you get overworked like that, because uh, there's a special energy that goes into performance. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, you kind of build the energy all day long um, to do a show, and then that energy comes through for the people and uh, and I believe energizes them, and it's, it's a wonderful feeling when you're performing and... You know that, and I believe it's a spiritual energy that comes through. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think it comes from us. I think it comes through us. And um, people 
and you send it out in the audience and they send it back and it's it just the energy builds until the end of the show you leave people feeling better and you feel better yourself sure absolutely Absolutely. Well, folks, you've got some great opportunities to see this legend in concert up here in Michigan. You can go to wolvereneproductions.org and get your tickets. You can also call 1-800-445-2143. We also have that information on our Facebook page as well. And uh, these are all shows to, de to uh, help the uh, Deputy Sheriff's Associations, the Policemen's Associations here in Michigan. They do them every year. And uh, my kind of country is a proud supporter of these shows. And, oh, uh, good for you. Good for you, Scott. Absolutely. Always great country music. And, Lacey, you're going to be up in Manistee on uh, July 9th, and then in Cadillac on July 10th, and she oh. Sheboygan on July 11th. So you're touring the mm. state in just a few days there. <laughs> I know it's going to be great. And I, I have so much respect for our first responders. I, you, I do a lot of work with them. I do a lot of work with veterans. And, um, I, I just uh, have a special place in my heart. Uh, for the first responders, you know, when you think about uh, what happened at 9-11 and those people were there within five minutes. Absolutely. Five minutes. Well, I know on a local level up here, I've lived here the majority of my life, and uh, there's been many times where we've had, you know, help from the firemen and policemen, and they are, they're always, like you said, they're always right there, and we've been sponsoring these shows for a long time, and I've been going to these shows forever. We've been doing them up here for years. In fact, years ago when I had my band, we used to open for a lot of the, the, the big acts. We opened for Billy Walker and Jack Green. And, Did you? back in the day and and we've always been just a huge supporter of these shows and it's a great opportunity to get real country music up here because we don't get a lot of that so it's always a pleasure when they're when you people come up and see us we appreciate that well we're thrilled to be up there and i've always had a good time i've really always had a great time in michigan i my i had relatives who lived there worked in the automobile industry as i was growing up and i would occasionally go out and spend a summer with them and stuff and just always it's had a it's a beautiful state you know, the northern part up there, it is just, oh. Yeah, it is pretty. Kind of wild and, you know, just beautiful. It's, I, I really like it. I'm glad we're, we're going to be coming. I, I, how's your weather out there? Are we going to have good weather, you think? I think, well, summer is officially here. It just kind of came this weekend, and it's, you know, 80 degrees now. and <laughs> So it's just kind of here. <laughs> what happened out here? We really didn't have a spring. It kind of went winter summer yep. <laughs> yep it doesn't give the body much time to get used to the to the change i mean it went from really we had snow a couple of days and then real ra rainy cold nasty and then all of a sudden the sun came out with like 90 degrees yep. <laughs> like, that's exactly well, what's me? happened here too i guess yep. you've made up your mind <laughs> yep so i think you're going to be in good weather up here and uh, of course in september october the colors are changing it's beautiful oh and, i'm so uh, looking forward to that trip yeah. i'm so looking forward to it and i'm looking forward to this one as well i've just uh, haven't been out there in a long time and i think it'll be fun to see a lot of the the fans i haven't seen and you know i've been independent for so many years now that uh, most of your audience probably thinks i'm deceased <laughs> <laughs> and i don't get back to nashville much to do the tv shows because i live way out uh up in the mountains by the old town of virginia city above reno nevada and um i came up here for the uh, because of the wild horses i played all the clubs up here in Reno, you know, Harris for many, many years, and the Nugget and all those, and uh, and still do occasionally, and um, I fell in love with the place because we have the largest uh, contiguous herd of wild horses that is not on a reservation. You know, it's arguably the, we have about 3,000 wild horses up here. Wow. wow. And they, won they wandered to my yard. I, when I first came here, there would be 30 or 40 every day walk through my yard. Wow. And I thought, well, if they can be wild and free, then maybe this is where I need to live, and that's why I moved here. Well, you've done so much to help them. The Let Them Run Foundation is a wonderful organization. You've done so much to help all these wonderful animals, and I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. As a, as a big animal lover, I, I just think that's the best thing to do. Do you know, I think the American people generally love these animals, and they, you know, I really am one of the uh, advocates, I really am a proponent of birth control, and the reason is, it's just like when we first, I don't know if you remember, but you used to be able to get an animal from a pound, and it, you, it could be, it wouldn't be spayed or neutered. And then came a time around the 60s, I think it might have been earlier, but I remember it about, oh, high school time, I remember hearing that you could no longer get 
uh, an animal that was not spayed or neutered from a pound. And I thought, oh, I thought, that's so sad, those beautiful animals. What if you wanted to have pups from one you really loved? Then I realized, and I found out later, that we were killing, we were euthanizing six million companion animals a year yeah. in the United States. And we had to do something. Yeah. So we've used birth control, and it's worked out, I think, very, very well. Um, I think it's still, the number is still staggering. The last number I heard, and uh, I probably shouldn't even say it because it's been a year or two ago, but um, it's still in the millions of companion animals that are euthanized because nobody wants them. Well, that's sad because uh, there are some wonderful rescue animals. We rescued a uh, a dog almost two years ago, and she has been the best the best dog I've ever had, and she's a wonderful family dog, and uh, I've gotten so much love and joy out of her. I just can't imagine, you know. And I know you've got you've got a very special rescue dog that's uh, become quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> Not only you know, I've been in dog rescue for many many years. When I was in Nashville, I used to take the big dogs. I had a big ranch, so I had a about oh I think about a half an acre, maybe a full acre. It was a big big area with a I had a barn for them where they had a big huge cedar shaving box that they could sleep in if they got along with everybody. And uh, I would rescue the large animals and the problem animals because I knew they would be the first ones to be euthanized. And uh, just recently, you know, I kind of hoped that I wouldn't be rescuing such big dogs because, I mean, I always had the, the really the sheep dogs and all these, you know, Bernese Mountain dogs and all these big, big things. Well, I got a call uh, from a friend that uh, she was a, a, she was aware of a dog in the Burbank Pound who had been there since he'd been a puppy. He was a, he spent his whole first year in the Pound. And the Pound people loved him down there in Burbank, but everybody had six dogs at home, and it's in the city, and nobody could take any more. And the staff raised $600 to uh, to get this dog uh, rescued, and he wasn't getting rescued. And so my friend called me just sobbing. I, mean, I was out in Ohio somewhere on the road, and she said, oh, you, and she's bawling her brains out. I said, what in the world is wrong, Cheetah? And she said, oh, we have to save him. We have to save him. And I said, who do we have to save? And she said, Carl, Carl the dog. <laughs> and, and, and I said, Cheetah, I'm on the road, and it's like midnight. You know, I don't know what I can do. They're going to kill him. They're going, we can't let them kill Carl, the dog. He's been in the pound his whole life. He's just a baby. I'm going, uh, let me think about it overnight, and let me see if I can see somebody that's at home that can that will handle him, you know. And, uh, of course, she called me at 6 o'clock the next morning, my time. It was, you know, whatever her time was, I don't know. And she said, Lacey, you have to do something. We can't, nobody can adopt him, and I don't have room for him, and my daughter doesn't have room for him. My daughter's pregnant, and she's hysterical. <laughs> I said, I said, does this dog, I said, you know, he's been in the pound his entire life. He probably doesn't know you can't do that in the house. <laughs> and, you know, he probably doesn't know, come here or anything. And I said, what kind of a dog is he? And she said, well, he's a big dog. And I said, well, what kind of a dog is he? And she said, well, he's um, Mastiff and Pitbull. <laughs> <laughs> I said, does he drool? And she said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Of course he did, and of course I took him because he only had 20 minutes to live the last time. She called me again, and she said, he's got 20 minutes, Lacey, please. I said, okay, you have to find a place for him till I get back home in a week because I can't let him go to my house because I don't know if he'll get along with my other dogs. <laughs> he kill somebody before I got home. And um, when I got home about two or three days later, Gina brought Carl up, and Carl... Uh, is really a good dog. He's kind of like Ferdinand the Bull, but as a puppy, as a one-year-old puppy, one year he destroyed Christmas. And we did a video of it, and we had the best time. We wrote a song. My friends and I wrote a song, and then we got together at my friend John's Veterinary Hospital. And John, you know, we were all dressed in scrubs and stuff. It was right around Christmas time. Carl had eaten Christmas, so we wrote the song Carl the Christmas Dog which later turned into this video, which you're, people can watch if, if you want to see this thing. It's still on there. It's on YouTube. Uh, Lacey J. Dalton, Carl the Christmas Dog. And um, he actually now has his own book. And this year we're going to try to slide a 
CD of the video into the back of the book, and uh, it, there's no living with him now. <laughs> I mean, I, he's impossible. I mean, you know, between the cape and the crystal bowl, I mean, it's a... Uh, you know, it's, just, it's it's hard being around him now. He, he's still kind of placid, but you know, thank God. But you know, he wants <laughs> things the way he wants them now. He's the diva thing has kind of hit him. Well, you know, that'll <laughs> happen. Fame and fortune will hit you that way. Well, I, I know, I, I know. I think my daughter is the uh, the charter member of the Carl uh, Carl uh, fan club. She just absolutely the first time she saw that video, I mean, she just laughed hysterically. She knows all the words to Carl. I have a picture of Carl in my studio. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. That uh, <laughs> you do. Yeah. Well, see, I have a picture that Merritt drew of Carl, and I have it out where I, in the dog room where I feed them. And every morning I get to look at the, her. Uh, Merritt's picture of Carl the dog. It is so cute. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we've had a, we've had so much fun. That whole thing was just fun. It was. That, that, and all that the money that goes from the the book is now um, uh, my guitar player Del Ponet's wife did the illustrations, and Leslie Adams, um, my manager, produced the little book, and it's just a little um, paperback book uh, about a foot square, not even probably. Yeah, Maybe nice, nice little storybook. What you're, do you think? Yeah, I'm terrible with measurements. Yeah, it's just know. a nice little storybook, and you'd sent one to Merritt, and I've got to actually have a picture of her. She sat down and read it out loud to our dog, and our dog just came over and sat down and listened intently, <laughs> like she knew it was about a dog. You know. <laughs> I, I wonder what the reaction your dog would have to the video. I don't know. I have to watch we'll to play it for. Her, but we love her here. You know that. That's great. <laughs> well, Carl, I, Carl, uh, you know, I, I told him I'd foster him for. A while so of course he's here permanently of course yeah of you course. know drooling he does drool by the way <laughs> never really wanted a dog that drooled a whole bunch but you know when you love a dog or anything i guess if they drool if your husband drools you gotta love him anyway right absolutely well being a <laughs> typical musician you turned it into a song so that's the, that's the greatest <laughs> tribute you can give him right there <laughs> you know it's funny we're using all of the uh all of the proceeds from that we make from carl the dog goes to um the Let Him Run Foundation. Oh, that's wonderful. That's so wonderful. we can help other animals. Wonderful. And we do help other animals besides horses, but oh, we mostly, uh, we're mostly concentrated on horses because the wild horses out here um, and everywhere, uh, the government really would just like to euthanize about 50,000 of them. And the advisory board for the Bureau of Land Management, which manages most of the horses, um, did advise them to euthanize 50,000 wild horses. People don't know this. And, and the, the American people made their will perfectly clear in 1971 that they wanted these horses to have, now listen to this, 88 million acres of land where they were to be the primary animal. Wow. 88 million. Now the BLM has somehow whittled that down to 55 million acres, and they're still saying they don't have enough room. Jeez. Well, the fact is, with all the development, you know, uh, housing developments and industrial parks and so on, um, the horses' the habitat and their migratory paths, they migrate hundreds of miles now on the Natch, um, that, that's all disturbed. So what Let Them Run suggests is that, you know, in some of these 55 million acres, we could have eight or nine 250,000 acre plots uh, that would need to be, you know, secured, but where people could go and interact with these animals in a non-invasive way and enjoy them, you know, take safaris out, have photo safaris, and have folks who are uh, disabled be able to go out in golf carts or little jeeps or something, have trail rides. I think it would, the perfect place would be, and I always say this, uh, like the Lakota Reservation up at Standing Rock would be a great place to start a program like this if, if the Indian people were willing uh, and the government could help support the project um, we could return the horse culture to the Lakota Nakota and Dakota peoples and this they were the they were the finest light cavalry in the world back in the uh, back in the Indian Wars that they were considered the, the most incredible horsemen and uh, you know and they're also the Cheyenne and the Crow there are a lot of the horse tribes if we could return that culture to the people and have a tourism component where people could go onto these reservations, visit their casinos, see their culture, see their dances, you know, see the art, and watch the the way that uh, Indian people, traditionally Indian people, um, train and 
and uh, ride these incredible animals. They're incredibly sturdy animals. They they can just live on just about nothing. It's amazing what these what these animals can do. And just recently, the most exciting thing of all is we have found out that they do horse therapy for um, returning veterans, men and women with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder. Well, what we found is that they've been working always with domestic horses and have only really funded domestic projects. What we found is that the wild horses have even a, a more um, acute ability to sense trauma wow. in a person. And the Indians used to say the horses take our burdens. And I I always thought that meant they carried our teepees and pots and cans and blankets <laughs> and stuff from one place to another. That is absolutely not what they meant. What they meant was the horses somehow, and it seems like magic, and there's probably a real scientific um, way to explain it, but I don't know that, but I do know that this happens. Those horses somehow absorb the trauma from those returning veterans with uh, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. It's wow. done in a, in a very, but sometime when we have more time, Scott, I'll tell you what the process looks like, at least as it's been explained to me. And um, we are having incredible success. It ha happens pretty quickly. The horses seem to be able to really somehow absorb the trauma, and then they walk away and they shake as so though they're shaking off water. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's amazing. Well, and, I believe, uh, I believe and, and I think it's very, very hopeful. You know, service animals have been proven to really help um, all kinds of service animals, help people with post-traumatic stress. But the horses seem to have a special gift for it. Oh, and I wonderful. think the Indians have known it forever. Sure, sure. Well, that's wonderful. Well, the Let Them Run Foundation, folks, please check that out. We'll put that link on our Facebook page again. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Oh, you yeah. know, we, um, <clears throat> we're we not boots-on-the-ground people, but we know who the boots-on-the-ground people are who are really doing the work and don't have the time to raise money. They're yeah. so busy yeah. rescuing that well, they we... don't have time to raise money. So that's what we do. But we keep a close watch on who's really doing the work and who's just doing it to get attention or be somebody. Uh, that's very rampant in that horse advocacy. A lot of people are in it for the glory. Yeah. And we make sure that the, our people aren't those people. We okay. make sure that our people are the people who are actually doing the rescue, and not only just rescuing and hoarding horses and keeping them forever on the public, you know, dollar, you know, by, by asking for donations. But the people who get the horses, you know, rehabilitate them, put a little training on them when we can, and get them down the road to homes. Yep. And my brother, you know, my brother is very active in that. He uh, has a horse ranch in Georgia, and he works with a lot of, of those animals and trains them and get, helps get them out. And so that's how I appreciate anyone that can help out with that wonderful. I, I thank you for all you do there, Lacey. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You tell your, your is it your brother-in-law? Yeah, my brother. My brother. Yeah. Your brother. Tell your brother, um, if he needs horses, we have so many baby uh, horses. Well, Some of the tribes um, like to send the mares when they're heavily p pregnant to slaughter. And because they're heavily pregnant and they're traumatized by being rounded up and put into little trucks and stuff to, to go to slaughter, they often have their babies either in the holding corrals, uh, they'll have them early, or they'll just deliver, you know, in right in the uh, trailers when they're being, and that's a bad situation because the yeah. babies almost always get trampled to death. Yeah. But we get a lot of those babies, and we have a lot of those babies. And if your brother ever wants some baby Indian horses from up in Washington and uh, Oregon and Idaho and up that way, um, we have those horses, and we can run them out there. We run them out to Texas, and we run them out to New York City. And, of course, you know, they all have to have health certificates and a Coggins um, immunization, which is an immunization against a very virulent disease. And they have to have health certificates, and you have to pay for the transport, which is expensive in itself. Yeah. So that's why we raise money. You know, we and uh, you know we uh, just happy to get these horses rescued and into homes where they are loved and going to be taken care of as a family member for the rest of their lives. Doesn't always work that way, but if it doesn't work out for people, we will take the horses back. 
Well, that's good to know. And Tom will be hearing this interview, so I'll, he'll he'll be sure to know that, and I'll have a oh, good time for sure. Um, well, he'll be listening to it on our station. He's he lives okay. in Georgia. He's in Georgia, actually. I thought you said yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, they have a lot of grass down in Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we don't have in Nevada particularly. Absolutely. And LaceyJDalton.org is the website also for Lacey and WolverineProductions.org for all the great shows coming up. Lacey, let's uh, talk just for a minute about your new EP project, Scarecrow. Oh, I am so excited. I am so excited about it. You know, we um, we had some very, very... It's, it's, First of all, the most wonderful thing, it's already been nominated uh, for a song of the year by one of the awards uh, giving uh, country music magazines. And it, uh, and it surprised me because it's, I, it, I, my audiences are really liking this song. For the first time ever, um, I have a song that no one has ever heard and I'll be singing it about three quarters of the way through my show. And all of a sudden, there'll be people will be giving us a standing ovation. Wow! It's a very it's a very passionate song and an intense song. Um, it's a song that I wrote about twelve years ago. I had a, a long marriage that ended really in, in quite a betrayal, and um, it was uh, you know financial and it was you know I mean I just went to smithereens and I wrote about it in this song called Scarecrow and. Uh, I kind of introduce it that way most of the time. I say this is a song I wrote after a very long marriage that didn't end as well, you know, as I would have wanted it to. And um, people are just, uh, they're moved by it, and I'm surprised because I, I cannot categorize this song. I cannot tell you, I, I could not call it a country song i could not call it a rock and roll song i could not call it a folk song i don't know what it i call it extraterrestrial <laughs> <laughs> interplanetary music <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> but um i sure am enjoying playing it on the road and the other i have uh, three other songs on the um on the yes, ep is what we call it because there are only four songs on this one um and there's a song called it takes an earthquake sometimes as well and that song talks about you know Sometimes it takes a, something earth-shattering to uh, get your spirit to grow. You know, sometimes spirit has to hit you right across the, you know, forehead with a baseball bat to wake you up. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so I wrote a song called It Takes an Earthquake Sometimes. And it was so funny, I was talking with a DJ down in June Lake, and he said, you know, my mom used to say something like that. He said, I can't remember what it was. He said, I'm going to go call my brother. So he called his brother and he called me back and he said, my mom said, what my mom used to say is, don't wait for an earthquake. Yeah. And I thought, well, there's a sequel. I'm going to write that song. There you <laughs> don't go. wait for an earthquake. <laughs> you know, try to see the signs coming and prepare yourself and grow, you know, without having to have a shock to grow. But I think sometimes we need that. Yeah. Well, it's people put to music, you know, that's the best way to describe it, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, you can get that, folks, at Amazon and Spotify. Uh, the, the EP is called Scarecrow, and we're going to play Scarecrow here in just a minute. And of course, we're gonna... <laughs> you know, I, I always feel sorry now that I that song is like almost five minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel so sorry for people in radio. I go, hmm, are you sure you want to do this? It's uh, you know, because uh, I'm independent and I don't really depend on radio necessarily for the way that my music gets to people. Um, I'm now unlimited. You know, I don't have to stay to three minutes or three and a half minutes, and so I don't. But sometimes I think it's a little self-indulgent. <laughs> I think, you know, you used to do these things. You know, I wrote a lot of hit songs that were three minutes long. And, uh, you know, you can compress a lot into three minutes. Absolutely. Well, the nice thing with the internet radio, we don't have to worry about that. We can play it. Oh, and, you're, uh, that's right. You're wild. And yeah, free that's right. That's right. We can play it. My gosh, and I will, <laughs> and I do. You know what? We've had a wonderful <laughs> run with it. It's got already seventy six thousand hits on Spotify, and uh, people are hearing this song, and I'm so happy. 
and I'm so happy for the nomination for Song of the Year. Absolutely. Congratulations. That is Thank wonderful. You. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing it live. And, um, of course, you're going to be playing so many of your other great hits. And I know Dale Panay is going to be with you on this trip. Such a great uh, get, great guitar player, nice guy. And uh, you'll get a kick out of him in the Carl the Christmas Dog video, too. We, we call it the, oh, da- the so Dale Dance. Oh, he is so funny in that. And we have uh, <laughs> our friend Bruce Thompson is coming to play, uh, play bass with us. Oh, great. Which, uh, and you're going to like him. He's a wonderful bass player. I think I'm, I mostly hire him, I tell him, because it looks so classy to have that stand-up bass. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love stand-up, yeah. <laughs> he, he's a wonderful guy and a really good musician. And we have a lot of fun with the show. I think, I think our shows are fun, and I think you guys will have a really good time. Oh, I know it. Absolutely. Well, folks, please go to WolverineProductions.org. Some great shows coming up uh, July the 9th in Manistee, uh, July 10th in Cadillac, and July 11th in Sheboygan. And then September, she's going to be in Battle Creek, Traverse City, Muskegon, and at the Adrian College. In October, in Charlotte, Michigan, Owasso, Michigan, uh, Allegan, Michigan, and St. John's. So we will continuously uh, update you with all those dates and uh, put Wolverine's website on our page so you can go get your tickets and not only support the great uh, cause that it's for, but you'll get to see a fabulous country music show as well. So, You know, uh, Scott, I just have to say that, you know, Wolverine uh, is a very trusted company out there, and you guys have been working together at, the, at your radio with Wolverine for 30 years. Am I, am I correct in that? It's been a long time, yeah, a long time. Def, I mean, <clears throat> to maintain the trust uh, uh, for that long, for doing these shows, you have to be doing something right. I'm so excited to work with all of you and and uh, come out there. I really, like I said, have a have a heart for our first responders. I um, I especially uh, especially have a heart for them. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, folks, I will be at the Manistee Show, so uh, please come up and say hi if you're there and let us know you heard it on the radio. And then, of course, we'll be at the Traverse City Show as well. That's in September, September 6th. So, Lacey, we're looking forward to it. Wish you safe travels, and we're looking forward to seeing you. And thank you, as always. I just can't tell you how much I enjoy our conversations. You're just a great, great person to talk to, and I always love spending time with you. Well, right back at you, Hoss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is Lacey J. Dalton. LaceyJDalton.org is the website. Amazon and Spotify have the new EP, Scarecrow, and we're going to play that for you right now, along with some of Lacey's big hits, uh, 16th Avenue, Crazy Blue Eyes, Taking It Easy, and just to get some great music out there from Lacey J. Dalton. Thanks again, Lacey, for being on My Kind of Country. You betcha, Scott. It's always a pleasure, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Us too. We'll see you soon. Thank you again. All right. Adios, my friend. Scarecrow flapping in the dust bowl wind. Never gonna pass this way again And if by chance I'm back this way Nothing around here's gonna be the same Cause everything changes Nothing stays the same Everything changes And I'm just hoping I'll outlast this crazy waste in pain Cause everything is different without you Everything is different without you Things are twisted, weird and strange I'm coming on, I'm rearranged without you Dark clouds racing across the moon Freight train blowing by here soon Listen to what the old folks say About how fast time slips away How everything changes Nothing stays the same Everything changes While I was playing love for keeps You were playing games Now everything is different without you Everything is different 
different without you You were shallow, weak and cruel I was just a crazy fool about you About you Stops eating me alive For years and years I rested my trust on you And I just can't believe How hard this precious soul dream Love with my body 
but none I could touch with my heart. Why do I fall for those crazy blue eyes, those mavericks who won't settle down? But I never could stand the touch of Let them run. 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 Let them run.
is burning and the rain keeps pouring That feeling I'm losing you Black coffee, green envy Jealous of the way that you used to love me From the corners of the country, from the cities and the farms, with the years and years of living topped up underneath their arms, they walk away from everything just to see a dream come true. So God bless the boys who make the noise on 16th Avenue. With a million dollar spirit and an old flat top guitar They drive to town with all they own in a hundred dollar car Cause one time someone told them about a friend of a friend they knew Who owns you no know, a studio on 16th Avenue now some are born to money They've never had to say survive And others swing a nine-pound hammer Just to stay alive There's cowboys, drunks, and Christians Mostly white and black and blue They've all dialed a phone Collect a home from 16th Avenue
Ah, but then one night in some empty room where no curtains ever hung, like a miracle, some golden words roll off of someone's tongue. And after years of being nothing, they're all looking right at you. And then for a while you go in style on 16th Avenue. Oh, it looks so uneventful, so quiet and discreet. But a lot of lives were changed down on that little one-way street. They walk away from everything just to sing for me and you. So God bless the boys who make the noise on 16th Avenue. Hey, God bless all the girls who make the noise down on 16th Avenue. From the corners of the country, from the cities and the farms, with the years and years of living tucked up underneath their arms, walk away from everything just to sing for me and you. So God bless the boys. <laughs> Just making it easy, taking it easy with you. Somewhere far away, those night birds call my name. I can hear them singing love songs just for me. You for a million summer nights, this dream has. It's just you and me and the stars and the sand and the sea. Just making it easy, taking it easy with you. Every time I look into your emerald eyes, I just want to take you far. Just one.